I am totally thrilled to announce the next webinar at Unregistered Academy. This will be The Religious Right, Its Rise, Fall, and Resurrection. That'll be next Monday and Tuesday, May 16th and 17th. Featuring Neil J. Young, the leading academic scholar of the history of the religious right, and Gio Panichetti, known to many people on Twitter and in alt media as an expert on the new religious right that is different from the good old Jerry Falwell days. This will be an epic confrontation between two very different ways of thinking about a very important movement in American politics. So go to patreon.com slash unregistered to become a member of the Unregistered Academy tier. That gives you free access to this course and every course at the Academy will be teaching, including my upcoming course on World War II called The Great Blowback. It's also available for purchase at thaddeusrussell.com slash courses. Check it out and I'll see you in class. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. Like me, my guest this week grew up in the left. But unlike me, he's still a part of it. But like me, he has a lot to say about how the left has gone wrong in our lifetimes. This is my interview with Christian Parenti. I am joined from Western Massachusetts by Christian Parenti, uh, whose work I have known for, Jesus, decades, I think, at this point, and um, whose work recently has been very interesting to me because you take on the left, one of my favorite subjects, and very critically take on the left, and on, um, in particular, on the left's sort of positions or politics around race, and then more recently, COVID. So I wanted to focus on two of your more recent articles, Christian, if, if you don't mind, the, the one on the so-called privilege walk, and then your recent article for Gray Zone uh, on COVID and the left's reaction to COVID, which I thought were both um, outstanding, rigorous, and contained very persuasive arguments. But I kind of wanted to start with just, well, before we started rolling, actually, you asked me, why and when I left the left, lost the faith, as you said. I'm wondering, you know, you're still clearly of the left, seems to me, but what sort of in a broader way was the problem for you with the left? Do you see sort of broader tendencies that, that led you to have these critical? Well, I think I've always been critical. I mean, you know, like like you, uh, before we you know, started recording, you know, and as many of your listeners know, you, you were you know, raised in a left-wing family. And I was also raised in the left-wing family and my father's left wing. Right. Um, and it was actually, you know, I mean, my father always had a pretty harsh critique of the left. I mean, my father, who's still alive, but has retired mm -hmm. being a, a, you know, writing and speaking. Um, he was, even though, you know, he was very partisan, uh, active, militant Marxist, he was also pretty critical of the left. Mm -hmm. And that was partly because he was red baited by leftists and he was like driven out and he kind of learned he lost his academic job. So he was hmm. he was red baited by leftists because hmm. he, um, you know, he would do stuff like defend uh, actually existing socialism, you know, 
And, uh, you know, when the, the Sandinista revolution was criticized, he'd be like, no, 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 the Sandinista revolution's elections are more democratic than the U.S. elections. You know, they, they allow foreign observers to come, you know, mm. and that's just like even for a lot of sort of socialists, academic types, that's just a little out there. And so, mm. you know, he was he was red baited and and um, mm. and so never got tenure. So, um, you know, so there was always a kind of like critical, you know, he was critical of the left as well. So I, I mean, that was always something that was in the air. And, um, and also like the, the kind of politics that I was raised with were very Catholic in a weird way. Mm. Um, you know, mm-hmm. you know he, he's very supportive of actually existing socialism and revolutions, but also very much a kind of like new deal, new dealer in a way, mm. you know, was very, um, had a soft spot for the whole kind of like New York new deal, which is why it's, that's how he, rose out of the working class. I mean, my grandparents were really impoverished immigrants from Italy on my father's side, you know, and then it was through this amazing public school system from, you know, like grade school on through city college, which is like, you know, free and really high quality. I remember like my father's grade school principal was some Italian from Italy, like PhD guy. And it was like, you know, this is all like LaGuardia and um, Vito Marcantonio, like, you know, so that, you know, he wasn't the kind of Marxist or isn't the kind of Marxist who, you know, who would poo-poo reform, reformist politics either. So it's kind of eclectic. And, and, and a, I mean, a lot of people on the left don't, they can't quite do that. They can't quite be like, mm-hmm. yeah, you support like this third world revolution because that's what's happening there. That's what, that's what seems to be possible there. And then, you know, defend the new deal over here. And, you know, mm-hmm. so I think there was a kind of, uh, there was that, but then, I, you know, being in the left and, um, moving to the Bay Area uh, as a young man, I, I hitchhiked across the country when I was like 19 or 20, moved out to the Bay Area and was involved in politics. And, and that's where it, you know, I really got, um, I marinated in the kind of activist culture. And there's just obvious and enormous problems with it. So even though I am still a loyal member of the left. I mean, from the beginning, it was very clear to me that there was a lot of just posturing, just a lot of morality, a lot of moralism. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. Right. And um, I mean, I wrote, co-wrote a piece with, um, actually with Doug Henwood, who I criticized in one of these mm-hmm. pieces, but probably 20 years ago, he wrote <laughs> this piece called uh, Activistism, or it was called Action Will Be Taken. And we were like, what's the ideology of the left? It's activistism. You know, because it's like there is at one level, you said there's no ideology, but there, there, there is an ideology. It was just like you must do, 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 do bear witness and, uh, you mm-hmm. know, run on this treadmill of like bearing witness. And, uh, and it's like, you know, this kind of moralizing. And it really, really is damaging for the left. I was just talking with a young, younger guy who is involved in an alternative energy. And he was involved in the kind of eco-socialist working group of DSA in New York. And he came late to the to the development of the program. They have, you know, this bill that they're pushing, which would require that the Public Power Authority of New York purchase and invest in clean power, which is good. And he supports that. I support that. But it would also require the Public Power Authority to get rid of these gas peaker plants. And realistically, what that means is that, and these are like, new they're like some of the cleanest gas fired peaker plants in the region and so it's like the, there was this narrow mind like we, we need we need to green this public agency so we're gonna you know step one is force them to sell these assets so that's just two things it basically means this isn't going to sell like politically and it's also like well then what happens if you know when there isn't going to be enough clean power immediately built out so when the energy is needed what's going to happen well they're going to have to buy it on the open market for more money from actually dirtier plants and this guy's mm. very under the hood on all this stuff and, and he was trying to bring this to people's attention and also he was like what what are the union connections where are we uh, have we reached out to the unions who, who work this infrastructure and it was like you know dissembling and uh hemming and hawing and it came out that like no you know they hadn't approached it so that like and it i use that just as an example of the kind of flawed policies that that even some of the better more 
active and sophisticated elements of the left fall into because of the 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 role of like moral witness, you know, and that like, and and this guy I was talking with, who writes under the name Fred uh, Stafford, you can find his work, he knows a lot about energy. I mean, his take on this was that it's just you know that there was a kind of religious kind of moral yep. bearing witness, and that that like the you know to descend to the realm of like, well, how are we actually going to get this bill passed? Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to have to actually make some compromises, like not sell these gas fired peaker plants, because in the medium term, you know, someone's going to be providing that kind of energy at, at peak periods in New York City. And, you know, so there are real problems with, with that, that kind of moral secularized religiosity. Yeah, yeah. So over time, I just it's just become more and more evident to me that a lot of what the left does is this kind of secularized religious stuff. And I think that social media has been really bad in terms of that. Everyone seems to um, fall increasingly into this kind of dichotomous thinking where it's like thumbs up or thumbs down. Like that's what you do. You read something and you're like for it or against it. And, um, you know, I frequently read things where I, I don't have an opinion. You know, I'm just like reading it to see what's there. And like, hmm. you know, it's plenty of things that I have strong opinions about. And I'm, you know, it's lots of stuff. I'm just like, yeah, whatever. Like maybe there's something I can use from it. Maybe not, whatever. But, but like, I mean, yeah. So I could go on and on, but. Yeah, no, we will. I, for many years, I have been calling the left secularized Christianity. <laughs> and it's amazing to hear you use the exact same formulation there. Is that, are we being fair though? Is it really a religious movement with religious thinking? Well, I mean, it's not religious, but it's like religion. Right. I mean, there's no supernatural thing going on. Um, but I mean, it is, it, it, to me, it just feels very Protestant, particularly because mm -hmm. it's about, you know, the individual calling and, you know, individual purity. I mean, a kind of Catholic version of religiosity, you, you're much more into like, if, you know, bureaucracies and institutions and coming up with ways to be like, well, you know, I'm sorry, you got to do what you got to do. Like, I'll, uh, I'll confess, I'll confess to the priest and we can take care of that. But as you know, Protestantism is like much more about um, purity, it seems to me. Right. Uh, so the culture feels Protestant. Right. It's about the individual soul and whether or not that soul is pure. And if it's not pure, it is of the devil. I mean, there's no in between, right? Yeah. So you're, you, if you have any, any connection whatsoever to the bad guys, you know, to Donald Trump or Republicans or, or capitalists, you're, you're worthless. You are, you're essentially evil by extension. And yeah. it, that's straight out of Christian thinking. Um, and I don't, I don't actually see much difference between the moral structure of Christianity um, and contemporary left-wing politics. It's just, um, it's the shame is also a big part of it, right? Shame, yep. Calling people out, mm -hmm. uh, clean and unclean. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like, you know, how you consume, you know, sort of like sumptuary laws. Yeah, it is, it is a, uh, a secular recapitulation of religious patterns. And my wife was actually raised in Christian fundamentalist family. And oh. I mean, she's, she knows what religion is much better than I. And she's like, yeah, this is church. Mm. This is church. This is what it's like. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, how do we get out of that? How do we break out of like, well, you think, I mean, I think you probably think it's hopeless, but um, I have not given up on whatever the left is. I've not given up on a kind of traditional left politics. I think the kind of politics that would qualify as kind of populist left. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's, it's very important that, that there be pushback against this kind of moralizing and moralism because it's um, it's damaging the cause of the left. And it's, uh, you know, we've seen that in COVID for sure. Yeah, we'll get into that for sure. So, so here's the thing though, why is this happening on the left? And is it only in the United States that the left does this? Why, why, why is the left in the United States uh, consumed with this religious thinking? That's a good question. I mean, I, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think it's the, the sort of the, the Protestant nature of the culture here. Um, 
I can't speak to the left everywhere in the world, but um, I mean, I know that, you know, in Latin America, uh, I, I have spent, you know, a fair amount of time in Latin America reporting, not participating in, in protest movements or anything like that, but reporting on them. And, you know, it's like people are much more the left, the left in Latin America is much more sort of like theoretical and abstract. Mm. And as an American, I would listen to these arguments and be like, what are these people talking? It's just like, how does this relate to like, what they're going to do in three weeks, you know, Mm -hmm. but then they come out of it, like with these amazing movements and, you know, plans for shutting down the capital, the country, like think of La Paz and, you know, being there when the, um, the city was shut down and the Mesa government fell right before the Evo Morales, you know, kind of ultimately within a year clears the way for Evo Morales to come into power. Um, Yeah. It's very, it's a very different culture, but it's not that there isn't moralism and, stuff like that. And it's also, you know, it's not that I remember when I was very young, younger, I, um, I went, I was raised mostly in Southern Vermont and there were, there was a commune. You'll like this story as a child of the left, Mm -hmm. there was a a commune and what, and there was a person on this commune whose bus literally broke down at the commune and, um, was part of the commune. And then this person in the like late eighties or, or so, uh, mid late eighties, went back to college and became a videographer. Long story short, ends up in Latin America and ends up um, doing video work embedded with the guerrillas. And long story short is I managed to hook up with this old family friend and spend time in FMLN occupied area of, of El Salvador. Oh, wow. And, um, during the war and then went back after the war and spent some more time there. And one thing that struck me, and this was like, at this time, you know, the time I went down, by the time I went down there, it was 1991. It was like the end of the war. The offensive had happened when they had taken, the FMLN had taken and held huge parts of the capital San Salvador for weeks and then had to fall back. And they were in their, on their way to negotiating a truce. And, you know, Time Magazine described the FMLN as the most sophisticated guerrilla movement the world had ever seen, or at least the Latin America had ever seen. And, you know, living in that village for a little while, it was very clear. It's not because people were made of something different and that they were like, didn't have destructive personalities and all that stuff. They had all of that, you know, all of the infighting, all of the like huge egos, all these problems. And it's like, somehow they managed to like, to get over it. And, um, I don't know whether that was rooted in the ideas. I mean, I, I suppose some of it has to do with the emergency nature of the kind of material crises that left that motivate left movements in the global South. And so in, in the U S the left is primarily a middle class thing. There it is. You know, that's it. That's, that's who occupies it. That's it. Yeah. Right. I think I, that's had, it. I had a very kind of weird epiphany in this, village I live in, um, the local sort of health board was running amok as far as many locals were concerned. And there was a little bit of pushback and a little kind of like, you know, um, anti-COVID uh, overreach movement formed. And, you know, there were a couple of meetings. I went to one of these meetings. I was frequently teaching in New York and unable to attend all of them. But like, remember at this first meeting, I I realized I was like, wow, this is the first political meeting I've ever participated in, not re- reported on, but that I've participated in where the majority of people don't have BAs. Yeah. And that, like, if you had pointed that out to me beforehand, yeah. I would be like, yeah, yeah, you know, I suppose pretty much every other political movement I've ever been involved with in the US as a leftist, a majority of people had BAs, you know? Mm-hmm. And, um, but it just hit me like, wow, the left is basically populated by a bunch of middle-class professionals and um and and, you know and it was like it was exhilarating to be with you know working class people fighting not for somebody else's well-being but for their own self-interest you know yeah and uh yeah and so it was both like exhilarating and like profoundly depressing like wow even in like you know i was was involved in the anti-gentrification movement in san francisco and it's like you know, there were, there's, you know, sizable percentage of working class people who were involved in that, but most of us had BAs or beyond, you know? So it's, um, I I've always thought of it as a rich person's politics 
And I think that explains much of it. And I think that explains the reaction to COVID by the left. I think it explains their ideas about race um, and their ideas about class too, which are basically no ideas about class anymore. The left has given up on class. But if you are, if you're wealthy, and of course, Americans, you know, relative to the globe are very wealthy, you know, our, our middle class, our rich people, you know, compared to people in El Salvador, you, um, you become inwardly focused, right? Because the world outside you, your, the external world and your, in your immediate world is fine. You're okay. You're not, you're not going to starve. You're not going to be bombed. There's no dictator coming to take you away and throw you in prison, but mostly yeah. you're not going to starve. And yeah. so, and, and- yeah. And then if you learn if you learn something about imperialism and if you, you know, maybe don't learn enough in my point of view about it, then you end up feeling guilty. You're like, oh, no, like mm-hmm. I have running water and, I, you know, I can I can mm-hmm. live on my salary and, you know, I'm not uh, fearing for my life. Like and so much of the world is, oh, I feel terrible, you know, like, you know, like, why do I have this? And, you know, obviously the next step is to, like, see things more structurally and uh and not get stuck in kind of methodological individualism but yeah i think that that that's part of what motivates the sort of guilt and then the shaming and the kind of vigilantism that goes along with that mm-hmm. and then i mean in in answer continuing with the answer to your earlier question how did this happen i think a huge part of it though is the, the role of foundations and um mm-hmm. i would think it's like anti-communism uh and sort of purging the the sort of socialist element out of the left as, as much as possible. And at the same time, foundations investing heavily in, you know, the new left, even at, at the same time that there's also a lot of repression against the new left, particularly those with class politics like Fred Hampton, who's assassinated. I mean, it's like, mm-hmm. watch, you watch, watch Fred Hampton's lectures. And you can understand why he was assassinated. He was just like super, I mean, just, I mean, he's only like 22 or 23 years. And it's like, mm-hmm. I mean, really, really sophisticated critique and ability to communicate with people. So, you know, decapitate those kind of leaders and then invest in divisive versions of identity politics. That's not to say that, you know, identity politics are only divisive. There's, you know, imp- there's important interventions um, under the, the, the rubric of what we now call identity politics. But, you know, there's been a like... 40 or 50 year concerted investment in trying to kind of fragment the left into smaller and smaller organizations with more and more niche focuses. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then a lot of this culture that, you know, you and I are describing as sort of religious also comes down directly from these foundations. My wife for a while ran, uh, a nonprofit. And um, I mean, I was always aware of this, particularly in the Bay Area with like the, the emergence of the Tides Foundation and sort of, you know, that's where I got a sense of like mm-hmm. how important the foundations were in funding and, and then how important then the nonprofits were to uh, organizing the left and, and kind of staffing left wing movements. And so, you know, stuff like the Privilege Walk, yep. uh, I mean, that, that those kinds of exercises and the, the worldview that they promulgate that's pushed by foundations by like the rockefeller brothers foundation wallace global you know tides if you are a an executive director running some nonprofit, you're going to be invited and heavily encouraged to participate in this kind of ongoing education which is this this sort of you know woke identity politics the ritual, the privilege walk and calling people out and all this sort of stuff. So it's to some extent out there. People are picking it up in the college classroom, this and that. But it's also just like routinely pushed on nonprofits by foundations. It would make sense that George Soros, who is the founder of the Tides Foundation, right, um, would not be so well, interested. He's the founder, I don't know about that, but well, he's, no, he's, the, he's, he's the man behind it, right? Isn't it? That's his foundation. I don't know. I don't know. I, I thought he's he's the man behind his own thing, uh, Open Society. I thought Tides was, anyway, I don't know what, I mean, I think Tides was sort of broader was, than that. I thought it was Soros, but I, okay, well. He, probably, I'm, he gives a lot of money. He probably, I'm sure his money gets mixed up in that, but who knows? Yeah, well, I mean, but I mean, I think you agree, right, that Soros funds a ton of identity politics um, initiatives, right? 
lots and lots and lots of identity politics comes out of him. It makes sense that a, a billionaire, uh, a massive billionaire would not be so interested in a global class revolution. Yeah, of course not. Yeah. Right. They want, yeah. they're into like horizontal oppressions. Not, not, they don't want you to think vertically about like, you know, what's, oh. what's the billionaire class doing to us, but sort of like, you know, uh, what's that other worker doing and are yeah. they, you know, out of compliance with some sort of um, behavior. What do you mean by horizontal oppression? I know you use that in your work a lot. I mean, like, um, you know, like two workers, you know, a man and a woman who are both working in some place and it's sort of, you know, as opposed to, you know, two line workers thinking vertically, like how's the ball shafting us to, to think in terms of like, well, is, is this man, like, is he insulting and demeaning this woman? Is he oppressing this woman? Like, you know, that kind of stuff. Like mm -hmm. you've got like, uh, you know, a hundred workers in some place. Like, well, what's the, what are the power dynamics here? You know, who's, who's at the bottom socially, who, who has more privilege, who's, uh, you know, has an easier time in life. That's the focus, right? Think about how all these people who are basically on the same social level as a class, how mm -hmm. can they be divided and think about themselves as a hierarchy, right? That's right. what, that's what uh, the whole, that would seem to me to be the utility of identity politics to the billionaire class to get, yep. to get people to look for oppression, you know, in the behavior and thoughts of their fellow worker, rather than to try and learn more about this really distant, hard to study class. Yeah. The billionaires, you know? Yeah. I'm thinking, yeah. I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about COVID now, but I want to not jump ahead, but I, I'm thinking about, you know, so with COVID, the left, you know, and you wrote about this, you know, is telling, is shaming people, telling you it's your individual responsibility to cure this thing, to, to get rid of this, wear a mask, get vaccinated over and over and over again was the mantra on the left, has been still, you know, so it's, it's horizontal, it's one to one, essentially, it's individualist in that way. And it's very uh, moralistic. At the same time, they're watching, they're getting those messages from MSNBC and CNN, whose major advertiser is Pfizer. And yeah. so, they don't look and from the up. Democratic Party, which is heavily dependent on pharmaceutical right. funding. So instead of looking, if they were to think vertically, as you put it, or, you know, in terms of structures and systems, if they were to do that, they would look immediately would look right at Pfizer and see that their ideas about COVID come from Pfizer <laughs> and the Democratic Party. Exactly. The government and Pfizer. Um, it's that was the most despicable thing to me about the left is that they seem to be unaware that they were taking marching orders from the U.S. federal government and the biggest, nastiest, worst corporation possibly in history, a corporation that I was trained by the left to hate for good reason. Yeah. But we'll come back yeah. back to that later. I want to before we get into COVID and stuff, I want to I'm going to do a little uh, detour into history here because you raised a bunch of fascinating. You mentioned a lot of fascinating chapters in left wing history that I'm very aware of and I've studied for a long time. But a lot of people who watch this show, listen to the show are not from that tradition. Or they don't know that history. So I'd like to just do a quick dive. So Fred Hampton. But I think this is extremely relevant. As you said, you know, Fred Hampton was a leader of the Black Panthers in Chicago in the late 60s and early 70s. When was he assassinated? Was it uh, right I around? Uh, I think it's like 69. Yeah, 69, 70. Yeah. yeah. And everyone should go. I don't know what it's called, but you can immediately find it, I'm sure, on YouTube. Um, he gave this speech about in which he called for for people of all colors to unite and he, he said, I'm for white power and yellow power and black power and brown power and all the power, but we should all unite, essentially, was his, was his argument. This was a Black Panther, right, saying this. So it was a class analysis, in a sense. You know, he was, I think he, talk, he was talk, talking for a unification of poor people and the working class against their oppressors who are up the scale in a hierarchy. So that was really, I mean, a, it's an amazing moment. And, you know, it could be, it set Fred... Hampton apart from the Panthers and the rest of the left in that way. But, you know, it could also be why he was assassinated, as you're saying, because he posed much more of a threat to the power structure. When you're talking about class, when you're talking about all the people, regardless of color, uniting against those above them. Yeah. Fred Hampton was in Chicago. And um, I think, you know, he was head of the party in Chicago. And I mean, among the things he did was he reached out to this politicized white group there, you know, the hillbilly highway, the great migration out of the South of African Americans yep. leaving the South as Southern agriculture is mm -hmm. uh, mechanized, uh, you know, and there's the pull of industrial jobs in the North. 
you know, part of the Great Migration also involves poor white people moving mm-hmm. north. So um, they call it the Hillbilly Highway. And there's a lot of, you know, Appalachian people from Tennessee and, and um, Kentucky and thereabouts who went up to places like Chicago. And in Chicago, there were these white street gangs that got politicized and they would wear Confederate flags. One of, them was, mm-hmm. one of them was called White Lightning. The other one was called the Young Patriots. Yeah. And they developed this. They had like a class analysis, but they were, you know, into their Southern identity and they would have Confederate flags on their on their <laughs> jackets. And like you can look this up, too. It's like there are meetings of the Panthers events where like the Young Patriots and the Panthers are together, um, <laughs> you know, articulating a class agenda. Yeah. Yeah. Class so that, agenda. I mean, that's like, that's a big no, no for the billionaire class. I should say, you know, know actually getting together like that, to be fair, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, Fred Hampton was not the only black Panther to talk in those terms. I mean, Huey Newton was, you know, a pretty much yeah. straight ahead Marxist by the end of his life and called yeah, for very similar things. A lot of them were, were quite Marxist, but, yep. but Fred Hampton was, um, you know, was unique in that he, was, I mean, he, his, he articulated a class analysis really better than a lot of other ones. I mean, Huey P. Newton and, and Bobby Seale were definitely, you know, Marxist. I mean, a, a lot of them, well, all the leadership were, the whole organization was, but, but he, had, he had it down in a way and he could articulate it and reach people in a way. And there were, you know, yeah. there were other elements in the Panthers that were more nationalist. And also, like, of course, people change, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, Huey P. Newton ends up as a sort of like social Democrat, kind of corrupt social Democrat uh, running the lamppost in nightclub in Oakland and, you know, mm-hmm. going to Santa Cruz. So and, you know, Eldridge Cleaver ends up as a, you know, a Reagan Republican. And, you know, so <laughs> basically a lot of them went through a kind of like from a kind of, you know, Malcolm X, so sort of a simple black nationalism into an increasingly sophisticated class politics, and then sometimes into, you know, a more sort of social democratic direction, and sometimes into a more revolutionary, um, and frequently kind of like still Marxist, but more black separatist revolutionary direction. That was like the Black Liberation Army that Asada Shakur was part of, had that line, like their their whole goal was to create like a black nation uh, out of like, you know, I forget, it was like Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia that like, African Americans should, you know, we have to wage a struggle to sort of have an independent state. So, yeah, it's it's hard to generalize, but 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 the entire leadership of the party is at at some point, you know, uh, soaking up Marxism and and you know heavily involved in that. Right. Uh, people definitely do change. This is a funny story. Um, I actually lived on the same block as Eldridge Cleaver uh, in the. Mm-hmm. This would have been about 1999, 2000 in Berkeley on College mm. Avenue. He had a house on College Avenue and this was toward the end of his life. Right. And it had a giant American flag hanging from it right in the front. And, you know, he was that's when he was a Reagan Republican. Yeah. Um, something else. Yeah. So, OK, you also have talked about Nick. I knew his daughter. His oh, daughter yeah? went out with a good friend of mine, Joju Cleaver. Yeah. Just to hang out with her. Yeah. Yep. Um, so you also talked about Nicaragua, the Sandinistas. And El Salvador and the FMLN there. It's a lot of people, I mean, have you noticed this? People have completely forgotten about the Central America struggles of the 70s and 80s that you and I were up to our necks in. My first job after college was working for a, a labor solidarity organization in which we brought together unionists from Central America and the United States. And I was completely into that. And everybody was. Everybody on the left was. What was, was that? Our, was that? Was that neighbor to neighbor? No, it's called Labor Action for Central America. Very teeny tiny little nothing organization. But yeah, you know, if you were on the left in the 1980s, you were primarily interested in Central America at that time. That was the main focus for us, right? And the Sandinistas and then the FMLN. And, um, you know, I now have, I'm pretty sure, very, very different politics around that. And I think you and I probably really disagree on the Sandinistas and the the Salvadoran communist rebels. Um, But I guess I wanted to, can you make a quick argument for your side on this I'm um, talk about the Sandinistas and why they were actually good. And well, I mean, you know, they, the Sandinistas were fighting in Nicaragua against the Somoza dictatorship. And it was like, there was a father and then a son inherits the, you know, control of the country and they're running it in 
to the ground. I mean, FDR famously is told that Samosa is the son of a bitch. And he says, yeah, but he's our son of a bitch. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's an earthquake and I think it's 73 and it's like, you know, millions of dollars of aid flow in and it's all stolen. And, uh, you know, the Sandinistas had already formed, I think, in 67 or something like that as a party. But that's really when the guerrilla campaign takes off. And, it's, and they turn towards guerrilla warfare in part because under this dictatorship of the Samosa family, there was no room for civil society and democratic politics. You know, there was mm. uh, tremendous repression. And so they fought this war and they won and they was you know marched on the capital and drove the samosa out and and took over and they attempted to have a very um you know mild version of socialism they invited the uh, sort of the leading lights of the kind of liberal opposition to samosa which is the chamorro family um they had they were a, a sort of big traditional political family in Nicaragua. They owned a newspaper and Violeta Chamorro was the widow of the guy. I'm forgetting his first name, but he was assassinated. I believe Somoso was implicated in that. So, they, you know, Violeta Chamorro is in like the, the government at first. And they were, you know, trying to reach out to the national bourgeoisie. They're saying, you know, we need everyone to participate in the, in the project of development. And they weren't like, we're going to immediately expropriate every little business here. You know, they were like trying to get, um, you know, trying to develop a mixed economy. They, mm -hmm. you know, they, at the height of the state control of the economy, it was still less controlled than the height of the British economy before Thatcherism, right? Less of the productive assets in the housing were, were owned by the government. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. Uh, immediately started funding uh, a, 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 a counterinsurgent, I mean, a, 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 a terrorist movement called the Contras. So the Somoza National Guard, which had you know been funded by the U.S., uh, when the regime collapses, they fall back into Honduras, and there they begin a war against the Sandinista Revolution. And the U.S. sends lots of money down to this. And, you know, this culminates in some um, American nuns getting raped and murdered by the Contras. And then there's a big, like, you know, hullabaloo in the U.S. And actually funding is to some extent cut off. The Bolin Amendment uh, reduces Contra aid to only not like uh, non-lethal aid. And of course, all this aid, money and aid is fungible. So... And what the Contras were doing was like they would go in and they would try and destroy the development efforts of the Sandinistas. One of the first things the Sandinistas did was they had this huge literacy campaign. They sent you know, volunteers to, out into the countryside to teach people to read. And, you know, those literacy teachers were targeted for assassination. Schools were burnt. Clinics were burnt. So the Contras were trying to destroy everything that the Sandinistas did. And you know, warfare is not good for, uh, for society. And, you know, ultimately there's increasing evidence of corruption, you know, in the Sandinista leadership. And uh, they ultimately lose the election of 1989 or 88, mm -hmm. I forget. I think it's 80, mm -hmm. no, it's 89 or 90, 89 or 90. But there's an election where they're expected to win. And it's like people vote essentially because they want the war to end, you know, mm. So they vote in uh, Violeta Chamorro, who had left the government and was running as, as opposition. And so then that's, you know, to their credit, um, you know, they, the Sandinistas hand over power. They don't, they don't call off the election. Yeah. And yeah. So the Contras were Reagan's, one of Reagan's pet projects. And of course, this led to the Iran-Contra scandal led right. by Oliver yeah. North, in which they were taking money from the, the mullahs in Iran and funneling it to the Contras illegally and in secret without the Congress knowing and then got in a lot of trouble for it. Right. Let me throw a few, oh. let me throw a few criticisms of the Sandinistas at you so you see what you, what you want to do with this. Um, so number one, I mean, Reagan's big thing was, you know, they were, they were close to the Soviet Union and taking aid from the Soviet Union. And Nicaragua, as he said, is what do you say? It's just a, a short flight from Harlingen, Texas, or something like that, right? Um, it would shrink. It became ultimately like four hours drive. At first, he's like, it's yeah. a two day drive. And then by the umpteenth time he had iterated, it was only four hours from Texas. Right. Well, I mean, he's, he's right about that. I mean, and I don't know what your position Depending on the Soviet Union. Travel, yeah. 
I don't know yeah. what your position on the Soviet Union was, but I mean, I am um, 100 percent opposed to anything that looks like the Soviet Union. So and I find it, you know, it was um, I mean, I grew up in a Trotskyist family. Right. So I learned to be an anti-communist, an, anti, an anti-Soviet from communists. Yeah. Right. Um, but, you know, no, what one, do you no one hates the Soviet Union like Trots. Absolutely. Absolutely. We hated them with a passion, still do. So that's in my bones. But what do you think about all that, that criticism of the Nicaragua, the Senate? Well, um, I think that, yeah, I mean, the, the Sandinistas got support from Cuba for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I, I think that that doesn't justify the U.S. Uh, attacking the revolution like that. I believe in the right to self-determination. And I, you know, I mean, the U.S. supported a totally brutal dictatorship and created this revolution to some extent. And it's not a surprise that the Reagan administration tried to destroy it and did a pretty good job of it. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that the U.S. particularly cares about um, oppressive conditions in other countries like that. When U.S. foreign policy is justified in terms like, you know, these these guys are oppressive. It's like, you know, but why not the Saudis? Why not any number of allies <laughs> who are also oppressive? So that I mean, that's a you know, that's a bullshit line. The real problem with the Sandinistas was that they were trying to develop a socialist economy, you know, and they were trying to um, undermine the power of capitalists everywhere and uh, particularly of U.S. capitalism. And so that was, I think, the main threat that they posed. And, you know, the, the justification for attacking them was that, like, well, look at the lack of freedoms in the Soviet Union. And, you know, that 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 system is is marching its its way, you know, closer to us. I don't think that was the real concern. And there was plenty of evidence that the Sandinistas could have, you know, if worked with, the, it would not have been uh, an authoritarian regime like that. I mean, they were bending over backwards. You know, they, they did um, censor La Prenza on occasion, which was like the main opposition paper. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they allowed this opposition paper. They were really trying to curry favor with the West, with the capitalist West, to avoid having a war and just being able to develop their economy. And it was also, you know, it wasn't just a ploy to avoid military conflict. I mean, I think there was also some sophisticated, you know, understanding that it's, it's hard for, you know, socialist economics have a hard time developing an economy and that um, there is some utility to having entrepreneurs and that sort of stuff. And it was like, they were genuinely interested in sort of what the national bourgeoisie could do to help develop the economy. Um, is that the kind of economy that you favor now? A mixed one? I mean, what does it matter what I favor? I mean, like, yeah, I, could, I mean, I could, you know, I could, what, what I, what I don't do, what I've never liked is the kind of Dungeons and Dragons version of politics of like, in my perfect world, this, that, that's mm. like, who cares, man? You know, what, <laughs> what, I mean, it's something I really don't think about that much. Because I know it's never going to, I'm never going to be asked in any way that matters. Like, what should we do with the economy? You know? So I think much more in terms of the here and now. Okay. And uh, that's probably, um, you know, uninspired, but Hey, I'm a middle-aged guy. You know, I'm like, I'm, I, I think I uh, suffer from realism. So I don't actually think about that. I could, I could spin out, some fantasy version of what a perfect economy would look like. But, you know, I don't, I don't think in those terms because I don't, I don't think that's really in the cards. You know, I think that, um, so what interests me is much more like the here and now, what are we going to do with this situation? You know, uh, how do the kind of politics that I'm interested in, which is basically greater class equality and reigning in this really overgrown uh, 1% and, and, and a really kind of dement, I think increasingly demented ruling class. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that American capitalists, like yes. as the economy has deindustrialized and become increasingly financial and also as the rich, I mean, inequality, you know, let's be clear. It's like the, the rich are like richer than they've ever been. Mm -hmm. um, just read an article out of, out of SF gate. It was by a sports writer. And I forget what the even subject of the article was about, but he made the point that, you know, like 
the richest person in the world in like the first Forbes list would have control for inflation, would have a, a, a fortune of like five or six billion today. Maybe mm-hmm. it was nine billion. Mm-hmm. You know, now the richest people have like fortunes of a hundred billion, mm-hmm. 60 billion, right? Uh, and they and they have a distorting effect on politics and, and the culture. So, I mean, I think that is, and, and they also, it seems to me like if you compare the old industrial capitalist ruling class, they had their feet on the ground in a way that these guys don't like Elon Musk. And these people are like obsessed with like, how are we going to run the cities on Mars when we like colonize Mars? It's like, what are you talking about, man? Take a look at this planet and how messed up it is. There's there are not going to be cities on Mars. Yeah. I mean, unless there's drastic changes to this political right. economy or so I think. So right. yeah, I'm much more concerned with that kind of stuff that, um, yeah. you know, how do we, how do we create a more sustainable, more just, um, version of this society. So while my analysis is Marxist and therefore rooted in a kind of revolutionary tradition, I also have, you know, critiques of revolutions. I'm aware of what the problems with revolutions. Um, but I, you know, it, it's still, that doesn't make it so easy for me to dismiss them. I think that, you know, when people are in a condition, in a situation where you, you can't protest, you get rounded up by some death squad and, and killed if you protest, it's like, well, what do you expect? They, they start like picking up the gun and they say, we have to change the entire thing. There's no room in, in this system for us. So, um, but yeah, so, so that's what I would say that. I mean, I'm, I, you know, I have, even though I would consider myself a Marxist, I have kind of like lame um, social democratic politics. It's sort of like, what could really, what, what could be done realistically in the next 20, 30 years here? You know, what's the world right. going to be like for my son? when he's an adult. Right. You know? So instead of nationalizing all the major industries, you just want Medicare for all. Yeah. I mean, I'd be down with nationalizing certain industries, but I just, you know, I mean, the left is so, so, so far from <laughs> having that kind of capacity. I don't see any force in this society that would be capable of, um, well, achieving a, a, an agenda like that. So it's like, so I therefore don't, I'm not obsessed with like, well, which ones should be nationalized first and how should we do it? You know, it's like, Mm-hmm. But, but okay. certainly I think that um, a mixed economy would work better. I suppose I, yeah, I suppose I support a mixed economy and I think it would work better if certain kind of commanding heights were run uh, as public utilities, you know, that um, certain kind of basic inputs were provided as cheaply as possible and didn't mm-hmm. become centers for looting and extracting and exploiting, for example, healthcare and energy and, you know, other infrastructure, and that this would actually be good, not only for people, but also for smaller businesses, it would lower their, you know, their input costs. So public utilities um, that are run by people like Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and Donald Trump, I mean, because that's who it would be. Well, That's look, you're asking me to speculate. I don't, I mean, you're, yeah, you're okay. trying to drag me into like uh, a pastime, a parlor, a parlor game that I actually really despise. I don't like Okay. It. <laughs> no, we're playing. I don't want to like, I mean, we're, we're into Dungeons and Dragons. It's like, okay, well, who would be, what are the scenarios by which it's like, I mean, whatever, you know? Okay. Um, back to Central America. So I certainly agree with you on this. Uh, you know, I was opposed to US imperialism then and I'm opposed to it now. So that's the reason I'm opposed to what was going on with the Contras um, and also the right to self-determination, as you put it, you know, that to me trumps everything else. They were, they were acting on that. Right. And I completely support it. El Salvador. um, That was very heavy funding from the Soviets, I believe, and Cuba uh, for the FMLN and the FMLN were, you know, they were much more Marxist and much more communist and much more interested in nationalizing industry and much less interested in freedom of speech and those things, weren't they? I mean, they were even back then, I mean, on the, in the Central America solidarity movement of which I was a part, I mean, that was, you know, I was much more comfortable with the Sandinistas than I was with the FLN and, and El Salvador. Uh, no, I don't, yeah, I don't think that's, that's the case particularly. Okay. I mean, first of all, there's, there was five parties. The Sandinistas were one party mm-hmm. and the FMLN was five parties that were forced to unify um, basically by Fidel Castro. They went n- numerous representatives of these different parties that had all started guerrilla activity were going to the Cubans asking for assistance and asking for training. And Fidel 
said, look, you guys got to unite into one organization. We're not going to deal with you like this. And we're not going to play favorites. It's like, you guys have to unite or, or we're not dealing with you. And so they united into this party. And even though they united and it's now, you know, the, the front is now a party in El Salvador. Um, the current president, yeah, uh, Miguel, he was actually a candidate. Uh, I think he was like, he ran, he ran for one of his offices. He won as an FMLN. I think it was mayor of San Salvador or something like that. But anyway, um, and, you know, there was there was different politics in this party. So there was the uh, the FLP, I think it was the FPL. They were like much more sort of classic Marxist Leninist. There were others that were um, sort of more social Democrat, loosey goosey, more into a mixed economy, more into like, you know, um, yeah, a kind of a concern with like a liberal form of politics. And more importantly than the ideas of these parties was the reality of the situation. And after their offensive in 89, it was clear that they were not going to win. And, and I remember the FMLN representative in the US in the Bay Area coming and saying, well, you know, claiming saying, well, we could take power, but what would we get? You know, we would inherit like a, a, a bombed out moonscape. So we don't want we don't want that kind of victory. You know, what we want is actually some sort of settlement in which the entire country can move forward. And that had to do in part with the times, you know, that it's like the whole, you know, vision that you could break with the capitalist order and that the Soviet Union would reluctantly support you. Because it's worth pointing out, you know, that the Soviet Union frequently did not like these guerrilla movements. There's a great book on this in terms of Africa called Conflicting Agendas, Washington and Havana in Africa by Pio Iglesias. And, you know, the Cubans get involved in a bunch of revolutions in Africa. Right. And they have Soviet support. But it is the Cubans who lead the way and, and, and basically force the Soviets, drag them in there. So, um, you know, so Fidel is really trying to create this like, you know, swarming of small states that are revolutionary. And um, but they, I mean, it was clear that, you know, once perestroika and glasnost happen that it's like that whole path is like is being closed down and all these movements start becoming much more nationalist and democratic like in afghanistan the people's democratic the pdpa which was a communist party which also was was made up of two factions the Kalk and the parchment that hated each other and killed each other and and the fmln factions also had a history of whacking each other um you know, they they changed their name to the Watan Party, which is the National Party. And it's under um, uh, Najibullah. Mohammed Najibullah is the leader. He like reaches out to um, uh, uh, the guy in the Panjshir, Masood, you know, who was the one Mujahideen leader who was most alienated from the CIA. He was the least they gave him money, but it's like they gave him the least money and he was like not he was not under their control as much as the other groups were. So, I mean, this was the pattern. So regardless of the ideas of parties, it's like by the time the settlement of that war was approaching, the FMLN's line was like, look, we have to have a democracy and we have to have a mixed economy. But, you know, we, we want, you know, we want the space, the political space to pursue development with with fairness. Did you say, did I hear you say that the current president of El Salvador was a member of the FMLN? He was not a member. He was a kid. I mean, he's only like, what? Yeah. He's young. Like yeah. But, but when um, he ran on the FMLN ticket, not this, he, he is not an FMLN politician, but in an earlier position, and I forget what it was, I think it was mayor of San Salvador or something like that. He ran, um, as an FMLN candidate. I mean, he, I think he is first elected on the FMLN ticket. Huh? Wow. Did not know that. Cause this guy, I forget his name. What is his name? The president, the current president. Uh, uh, His first name is, um, Nael Bukale. I'm forgetting his first name. Yeah. But Um, Bukale is his last name. Very interesting figure. Um, who's done a lot of things like made cryptocurrency, I don't know, it's, he's going to make it the national currency or something like that, or it's going to be accepted by the government or used by the government. And then also but, legal tender. And he gave everybody in El, in El Salvador, like I think $30 in crypto. And yeah, 
Yeah, and, and they want to have a kind of crypto, a green crypto farm funded by the hydropower from uh, the Wasapa volcano. Yeah. And um, yeah, so he's and, trying to do that. And, and he's very, he's very popular, he's, but he's very authoritarian also. And he's like coming down hard on the gangs, but you know. Well, yeah. I mean, the gangs <laughs> are really, are, I mean, it's very, very intense. Yeah, he's, 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 cru- he's, as I understand it, he's crushed MS-13 by basically locking them all up. And, um, and then on well, COVID, I, trust them. I mean, there was like some insane number of murders just in one weekend, like not, not too many months ago, but oh, really? there's been a whole series. That's a whole other story, but like, there's yeah. been a whole series of, you know, deals cut with MS 13 and then they get broken. And so he had one of those going and that, um, and previous presidents have similarly done that, you know, basically, you know, paying them, uh, to, to stop the worst of their violence and extortion, but. And, and look what he did on COVID. He, I think was the first government to give, to hand out ivermectin for free to the people. Yeah, I believe so. Um, people got like little gift bags from the government and it included ivermectin, I think even hydroxychloroquine. Um, but, uh, he had a very different take on COVID, which I thought was the most advanced in the world actually, which I I'm wondering, you know, if the FMLN had really held power, I don't- he was really FMLN. He wouldn't. I he's don't not. Know. He's not FMLN anymore. No, I know. I'm. I'm saying. I think that's. I think this is. This is an evidence that FMLN no longer controls that country. I mean, I don't think they would have. Oh yeah. No. 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 Taken these policies. On. I don't think they would have approached either cryptocurrency or COVID in this way. Oh, who knows? I yeah. Mean, we, I mean, it kind of. It, yeah. I mean, FMLN fell apart. Yeah. And changed. I mean, it's. You know, they they were this ultra well organized guerrilla movement, and then with the peace accords their leadership sort of went into the cities and started becoming this political party. And, you know, uh, a crisis of gang violence begins to take hold in the rest of the country. And they, my limited experience of visiting there in the mid nineties after the war was, I mean, that they had basically moved out of the countryside and um, were sort of overwhelmed with the tasks of peace, but yeah. But none of this is stuff that I've, you know, researched and written about. I mean, this is stuff I've experienced peripherally, but you're, 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 uh, you're wanting me to talk about things I'm not super qualified to talk about as well. No say. problem. Yeah. Let's, let's get into stuff you have written about recently. Okay. So you read this great article on COVID and the left for the gray zone, as I mentioned earlier. Um, here is a, lo- a couple lines that I just particularly love from this piece. Uh, this is kind of almost your punchline in it. Uh, You say at one point, the left has turned its back on liberty. Worse yet, the left now campaigns against freedom. Again, this is something I've been noticing for quite a long time. The words freedom and liberty simply do not appear in left-wing discourse anymore, nor have they for many, many years. I cannot remember the last time a leftist talked on behalf of freedom. What's that about? Why is that happening? And what are the consequences of that? Um. Yeah, I mean, that is, I don't quite know how that happened, but yeah, somewhere along the line, um, you know, liberty and freedom became seen as a right-wing thing. And it, I mean, as I say in the article, I lay out, it's like the left played a very important role, the left broadly defined, in making the Bill of Rights a reality, or particularly the, you know, the First Amendment. Um, at mm-hmm. first, you know, the First Amendment was viewed as only applying to federal territory, and states could restrict freedom of speech. So, you, you know, D.C. couldn't and you couldn't do that. You know, you couldn't restrict f- free speech and assembly on federal terrain. But the struggle to, to nationalize the First Amendment was led primarily by leftists, the wobblies, you know, protesting to have the right to free speech. The, the key cases that helped nationalize this uh, Gitlow versus New York is some guy named Gitlow who's published something called the Left Wing Manifesto in the early 20s and, mm-hmm. you know, goes all the way to the Supreme Court. And, you know, that's crucial. The flags being protected as speech. That's a young communist named um, Yetta Stromberg in California, you know, fights that case. So the left was really, really important in in making civil liberties a reality. And the left now has turned its back on civil liberties to the point where the ACLU right. editorialized for COVID mandates and for firing people who refused to submit to these vaccines. And I think at the time of that 
editorial, they might have still been under emergency use authorization, those vaccines, but maybe maybe they had been officially approved. So yeah, uh, the left has abandoned this and um, free speech is seen as the property of the right. And that is, I think, a total disaster. And we see, I mean, this, these levels of censorship, you know, and I say in the piece how, you know, people on the left, friends of mine, like don't even want to call what these social media corporations are doing censorship. Say, well, that's not really censorship because it's not the government doing it. Mm -hmm. Well, whatever it is, whatever you want to call it, I think it's wrong. You know, I think it is, you know, it is repressive and it is totally destructive of our political environment to, you know, cancel and pull down content which is labeled as misinformation. And it's, I mean, the, the Wall Street Journal had a good article the other day in response to the California law that's, I guess, limping along still, which would empower the state medical board to go after doctors who are guilty of trafficking in COVID misinformation, which is not defined in the bill. So it could be anything really. And the, the Wall Street Journal said, well, you know, and the closest it gets to a definition is sort of like, um, well, I forget what it says, but it's sort of, it's sort of like, what, what, you know, anything that's sort of like out of keeping with the accepted sort of standards, right? And the Wall Street Journal's argument was say, look, if, if this law had been in effect all the way along, we never would have made the shift from ventilation, like intubation ventilation to sort of passive oxygen ventilation. And that was, that was seen as, you know, in retrospect, we realized it's like forcing air into the lungs of people with COVID. That was not good. And the reason, you know, like over 90% of the people who were intubated generally died mm. had something to do with how, how bad that treatment was. And so now the standard of care is passive oxygen and passive oxygen earlier and, and to avoid ventilation as much as possible. And this happened, this shift happened because doctors were saying like, wait a minute, I know we're hearing that ventilation works, but I'm seeing that it doesn't work. We're experimenting with X, Y, and Z, and you know, just having some oxygen flow up people's nose, we're getting better results. That that could have been, you know, uh, dismissed as quackery, misinformation, and people could have lost their licenses if this law was in effect. So you're talking about this bill that's in the California state legislature right now. Am I correct? That would penalize doctors for uh, giving out what's called misinformation. I mean, it regulates what doctors can say to us to yeah. say to patients. It's amazing. Yeah. Has there ever been a bill like, has there ever been a law like that in the United States? I don't know. I mean, regulating I what doctors can say to people. I don't know. I mean, that medical boards go after people. The medical board in Maine has stripped Marilyn Ness of her license because she, you know, was deviating from their protocols. She was using uh, ivermectin and, I don't know. I don't know what other stuff she was doing, but they went after her and they they successfully stripped her of her license. And, uh, you know, there's been a couple other cases like this that have, have made the press. And I think there's a lot of this that goes on under the radar that doesn't make the press and just has a chilling effect on doctors. But yeah, but this law is the, the most audacious. And it was part of a package of laws, most of which I think are being rolled back. Like one other one would have lowered the age of um it would have said that children down to the age of 12 can get vaccinated without their parents' consent. Jesus. So kids in school, that got shot down. And there was, there was some other, uh, one of these bills I think would have made it Im illegal for insurance companies to, to offer insurance if you weren't vaccinated. I don't know all the details on all this stuff. So, but anyway, a bunch of really bad bills in California and, you know, Things that happen in California because it's such a big state tend to happen to the rest of the country. So it's good right. that 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 um, law of, um, that that bill that would have allowed uh, children as young as 12 to consent to vaccination, that that's been shot down. Wow. Wow. Yeah. All right. So listen, um, I've heard from many left wing friends that the the issue with covid is that or, or the, the mission of the left, they told me was to protect workers from the virus. And that's why they favored mandates and masking and social distancing and all the rest of it. Why, why were they wrong or are they wrong about that? Yeah, well, I mean, the piece is, I hope that listeners will read the piece. I mean, it's quite long. Mm -hmm. It's got like 120 something footnotes. 
Um, which makes it seem longer than it is. So don't get intimidated. Just read the whole thing. <laughs> um, in the piece, I, t- I take up the issue of disease severity and vaccine efficacy uh, and the effect of lockdowns, a number right. of things. So first of all, the disease is not as bad as we all thought right. in 2020, right? I too was out of my mind a little bit in early 2020, washing my groceries you know, trying to get my mother to wash her groceries. Mm -hmm. But it's because I was so freaked out that I was also reading very intently everything I could about how dangerous this disease was. And then it came out that Iceland did the first studies of, you know, large samples of population to try and figure out the real infection fatality rate, not case fatality rate. And they discovered, okay, wait a minute, this is not as uh, deadly as the initial modeling out of Imperial College London had suggested. And, and I was sort of waiting like for the effect of that to sink in. And then there was similar, like there was that cruise ship that was stuck in Tokyo Harbor. And even though there was all this like hysterical press about it, it was like, actually, you know, it, it, it suggested that there was a lower infection fatality rate than, than, than people had thought. There's these field hospitals that are open in New York. They're, they're all closed without being used. And it's like, so by mid late March, it was clear this was not the second coming of the Spanish flu right now. So that's one reason why all these lockdowns um, aren't justified because this is not as bad as we initially thought. This is essentially, you know, in the early iteration and now it's even less so like a quite bad version of the seasonal flu. Mm -hmm. And, um, so that's one reason. Then the other one is then vaccine efficacy. You know, you shouldn't support throwing people out of their jobs if they don't take the vaccine because the vaccine essentially doesn't work, right? Mm-hmm. It's non-sterilizing. You can't, you can't achieve herd immunity against this coronavirus, partly because coronaviruses mutate with such regularity that, you know, you can a huge part of the population can, can build immunity to one variant and then a new variant comes along and people will be re- reinfected as I was. Um, unlike say polio or smallpox, which are diseases that they just don't mutate as much. So they, they can be suppressed more easily. So the disease isn't as bad as we thought. And the vaccines, like they don't stop transmission mm-hmm. and they don't prevent illness. They do seem to cut down on the uh, risk of hospitalization and death. Though it should be said, the CDC has not released information that it has collected about hospitalization rates by vaccination status for people under 50. So Hmm. the the, the relatively good outcomes for older people may or may not apply for younger people. And the reason they gave for that is because they're afraid the information would, the data would be misinterpreted. You know, this was reported everywhere. This was in the New York Times, this was in the Washington Post, but then there's no follow-up on it. So, I mean, those are the two main reasons, right? That it's like disease severity and vaccine efficacy are not what we were led to believe. And therefore it is, I think, totally unjustified to use all this repression against people to force them to take these vaccines. And also these lockdowns, you know, um, they're, you know, the lockdowns have, damaging effects on people, as I lay out in the article, mm-hmm. all, all the kinds of, um, some of the effects that have been had, you know, felt in, in rich economies and in the global South. So that's what I would say to that. Yeah. So here's the thing. I need you to explain this to me. Uh, as we said earlier, you said this earlier, I mean, the left in this country is basically the most educated people in our society, right? It's, it's full of people with bachelor's degrees and more, right? I mean, these are very educated people, generally speaking. I don't know if they're the most educated people in our society, but they tend to be people with with higher education, with BS. very high, very high. Yeah. Yes, so so they're very well educated. Now, how on earth would those people so grossly overestimate the effects of COVID? How well, my theory of the crime is, as I lay out in the article, that it all has to do with Trump derangement syndrome and the the specific dynamics of that election. And I discussed the 1976 swine flu epidemic where a pandemic where it turns out ultimately that there was possibly, you know, uh, no fatalities from swine flu. But what happens is there's a, a couple soldiers get sick. One of them dies at Fort Detrick. And there's this like 
reaction. The U.S. creates a vaccine. 20 percent of the U.S. population is vaccinated, including President Ford. And, and then it becomes clear that, wait a minute, like the swine flu isn't really killing anyone globally. The WHO like can't come up with a body count. And the vaccine was causing Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, which is a you know, sometimes temporarily paralyzing autoimmune disease, but it can also permanently paralyze people and can kill people. And there's like lawsuits are launched against the federal government and the government suspends the vaccination campaign. And at that moment, that's when you see this symbiotic relationship between the regulators, like the, you know, the CDC and the FDA and NIH and, and Big Pharma. And they're like in this together, trying to hype up the, the pandemics. And they, they do that again and again and again with each new real and imagined, you know, infectious disease. They want to turn up the volume as much as possible. And until this election, there was enough critical capacity in the political class, both Democrats and Republicans, and in the journalistic class that some people would get caught up in this, but other people would be like, well, we've been hearing about Zika for months, but where's Zika? I mean, what, like, no, maybe we're not prepared to like go crazy over this because it just doesn't seem that serious, right? But what happened was that this disease got politicized and it got politicized from both sides. You know, in on March 9th, I quote it in the, in the paper, in the, the article, it's like Bill de Blasio, mayor of New York was still saying, oh, like if you get this and you're under 50, it's gonna be like getting a cold. It's really, this is about, it's like an intense flu and it really threatens the elderly and, and people with comorbidities. Two weeks later, he's shutting down all of the public schools in New York City. And the, I think what happened was the Democrats realized like, okay, this time we've got Trump, right? Never mind Hollywood access. All, I mean, all these kind of crying wolf, like this time we've got him, this time we've got him. They just like, they couldn't get him. And they're like, this time he's mismanaging this. We're going to get him on this. And in addition to that, the Republicans, Trump, um, leading the way was really like, okay, we're going to like pick up the gauntlet and, you know, we're going to accept this challenge and you know, we'll own the reopening and they'll own the lockdown. I think Trump thought that the disease was going to burn out faster than it did. And so the key moment is in late March when Trump says, we want to open the economy by April. And then there are all those protests at state capitals and, you know, there are armed, uh, you know, like Oath Keeper types, three percenters there. And the images of that are like, you know, terrifying for liberals and leftists. And so at that point, it was just like, it was off to the races. It was like, okay, the right is going to own reopening. The left is going to own the lockdown. And at that point, you couldn't be like, wait a minute. Well, you know, you know, they closed the field hospitals in New York. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's not as bad as we thought. What, uh, you know, and what about this great Barrington Declaration? What about the idea of like pro focused protection? I mean, you can't even discuss this stuff. You know, I mean, I had people literally scream at me saying, you know, you're trying to kill my children's grandparents, the educated people who like to argue and think about things, saying stuff like that. So and one thing that was revealed was that just how the kind of the movement left, the activist left is dragged along, was much more kind of beholden to the Democratic Party ecosystem than I think a lot of members of the activist left, the movement left would like to would like to admit. And so it just, there was no space to think about this and it became a litmus test. And it was like, and people just started, you know, getting into all the social media, cancel culture, shaming and, and the, the politics of respectability immediately kick in. It's like, what are you afraid of science? What are you like tinfoil hat, anti-vaxxer, you know? And out the window went everything that you know, everybody had been saying for years prior to COVID, like these are captured agencies, like, you know, and I mean, these public health agencies are really captured. It makes the effect, mm -hmm. like the captured nature of the EPA look like child's play, mm -hmm. you know, and I quote there, you know, the CDC's websites, the NIH websites, where they explain how, you know, basically 45% of their budgets come from user fees, which is, that they do research and they'll run experiments for pharmaceutical companies. And that's where almost half of their budget comes from, directly from these companies. Government paid scientists have the right to own patents and they can earn $150,000 per patent on top of their salary. Right. To be fair, most patents, the average patent makes like $9,000 a year. So it's a rare patent that you're going to get 150 k a year on it. But it's like, like that's what 
we mean when we say these are captured agencies. It's like, how do you expect there to be actual objective science coming out of an institution that, that's that dependent at every level on the industry it's supposed to be regulating? And so, you know, we got this. We got this, uh, you know, full court press for vaccines and, uh, and for censorship and, and lockdowns. So I think, I think maybe the main reason that many people on the left supported the lockdowns and masking is that they like those things. I've heard them say this. So they saw the lockdowns as being anti-capitalist. It's shutting down businesses. The left loves that, right? We love, we hate business. And so if you shut down the business, it's got to be a good thing. And then I've also heard many yeah, people on the left, ever. I've heard many people on the left say that they really like the masks because it's, it makes everyone feel part of a collective. We all look alike now. <laughs> <laughs> and and yeah, then third yeah. and then third and then third right it gives it gives people on the left it gives everyone but especially people on the left a golden opportunity to virtue signal all the time they get to show how great they are and how evil other people are all day every day just by simply wearing this thing on their face and yelling at those who don't so i think yeah. there's many reasons why the left was actually attracted to the lockdowns and the masking right and that's i think part of why they embraced it so much and and also, uh, most members of the left are part of the laptop class who yes who want to work from home. You know, That's right? Exactly. Not have to not have to commute, not have to go to those stupid meetings. You know, be able to be at home and like the stupid meeting is on is on your screen and you can you know not really pay attention. Um, yeah. So there was there were certain benefits. I think like the whole lockdown lifestyle was was nice for mm -hmm. for for laptop workers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, let's move on to this um, this hideous thing that I found out from you. I didn't, because I've never worked for corporations, big corporations, so I didn't, I wasn't aware of this. Um, the, this, um, <laughs> I'm just blanking on it, sorry. The, um, the privilege walk. Yeah, um, can we just- You've never heard of the privilege walk? I had never heard of it. Huh. I'd never heard of it. So for those of us, those listening um, who haven't heard of it, can you just describe this monstrosity and then let's yeah, talk about the politics? Village walk is where you, is where you have a bunch of people. It's like it's a um, a workshop technique used, invented on the left, and now used in you know corporate America, used all over the world. And it was in the summer of 2020, I think it was or 2021. I forget when uh, it came out that the U.S. military was using it, and so <laughs> like um, like Tim Cotton was railing against it on the floor of the Senate. Uh, and it's a thing that's been around and for years. So I, I experienced this early on and like when I first moved out to the Bay Area and over the years, every now and then people would bring this up, you know, people on the left say, oh, I was in this, you know, we did this workshop and the privilege walk. And so I should explain what it is. So the privilege walk is when you get a group of people and they stand on a line together and then you take one step, you answer a series of questions by taking a step forward or a step backwards. So the questions are, you know, like, um, if you're a heterosexual white man, take one step forward. You know, if you've ever been mocked for your appearance or your sexual orientation, take one step backward. Or, you know, um, this guy. If your parents, if, if your parents were in jail, you know, ever, you know, if you were evicted or, you know, whatever. Like I mean, any 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 number of questions can be applied to this. And so then in the end, you get this like array of people on the spectrum of privilege. You know, the those who are more oppressed. In the back and those who are less oppressed in in you know the front and this is supposed to reveal something you know generally it just reveals what you would already have guessed going into the going into a room and hearing people's accents and looking at them like yeah, if i had to distribute this like you know who's from a working class background you know who's you know who's straight who's gay who's trans who's working class i mean you can kind of guess at it and it's like that then that's what you get and it's like and you're supposed to be like wow see we're all like you know in these different positions. And this is the idea is this is gonna unify people, but um, you know, it, it does quite the opposite. So I would hear about this, you know, people are like, oh, we did this really powerful, interesting exercise. And I was like, yeah, I did that, you know, way back in the day. And it was like, I think maybe the fourth time I heard this, I was like, I gotta get to the bottom of this. It's like, <laughs> I suspected that, that like, that the people I had, had learned about this from were some of the originators and indeed they were. And so the story is that, Ricky Sherover Marcuse, who <laughs> whose father is an amazing character, but she mm -hmm. ends up as Herbert Marcuse's third wife 
mm-hmm. and widow. And she invents the privilege walk. And she basically, she dies young, tragically of cancer, like at age, I think only 50 years old. Mm. So she is, mm. remains somewhat obscure, but it's like Robin D'Angelo and the whole sort of diversity industry training scene owes a lot to her, stands on her shoulders. So she really helped invent that. I mean, she, um, she had a, in the late, beginning of the late seventies, she developed a, uh, a series of workshops about unlearning racism and the privilege walk comes out of her work. And she was involved with a therapeutic modality called reevaluation counseling, which itself is, has its roots in Scientology. It started by a guy who was on the board of, uh, you know, the original Scientology organization, Foundation of Dianetics or whatever it was called. Mm-hmm. And he was a lefty, Harvey Jackins. He came out of the CP. He was thrown out of the CP. He was a labor organizer. He's dragged before HUAC. And he then creates this, what some would call a cult. Others would just say it's a therapeutic mo- modality called reevaluation counseling or co-counseling. And it's all about this unlearning, you know, your internalized oppression and this sort of stuff. And it's they, the, the RC people in Trotskyist style would do this interest thing of like going into left organizations and trying to push their work, push their methodology. Hmm. So Ricky Sheriff Marcuse was involved in that quite heavily. And she, she influences from what I can tell she can, she influences uh, reevaluation counseling and is influenced by it. And, and it's, uh, in the eighties where she develops the privilege walk, which she calls the power shuffle working with a group called new bridges, which was a kind of summer camp, a political summer camp that brought uh, kids together, teenagers together to, to think about oppression. And so I learned about it at the new college of California, which was this wacky little institution that existed for a while in, in the mission district and um, learned about it from, you know, people who had, learned it from Ricky Sherrill from Marcuse at New Bridges. And I did the privilege walk my first class there. And, and um, you know, that was my, um, you know, it was also bound up with like, with, with a moment in which like post-structuralism was mm-hmm. getting big and people were, you know, leading Marxism aside for this kind of, you know, post-structuralist Foucauldian stuff. And yeah, so that's, that's the origin of the thing. And it's now it's used, I mean, it's used all over the world all the time. Well, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with the privilege walk? Why don't you like it? Well, I don't like it because it's part and parcel of what I see as a kind of divisive politics that uh, Mm -hmm. obscures and distracts from the basic bread and butter questions about how things are made, who gets what, who owns what, and that it's a distraction. And that it's, it's also that it's, it operates when it operates on the left that it operates under certain false pretexts, which is that the problem that the left has is that like the reason the working class isn't united and fighting for its interests is because there's too much racism and too much sexism and too much transphobia and all this has to be unlearned. And then people will come together and they'll wage the class struggle. First of all, you know, I don't, you know, I don't think that's, that's true. I don't think, that there's as much racism, sexism, and transphobia as these uh, nonprofit types are constantly telling people. And so I don't think that's the great impediment. I think you know, there are other greater impediments, one of them being mm-hmm. you know, not, not presenting a class analysis and not trying to organize with the working class, right? Mm-hmm. So it's, a, you know, it's an evasion of, of what I think is it, the important work for any kind of populist left. And it's divisive. And it's... Um, yeah. And it facilitates a self-destructive culture of condemning and competing and calling out. And it's like, you know, anyone who's been involved in the left, I'm sure when you were a leftist, you were, you know, privy to these kinds of uh, dynamics in which institutions implode and, uh, you know, people with, frankly, you know, frequently people with just sort of like terrible characters and, and um, psychological problems you know, can hijack institutions and organizations. <laughs> it's also part of the, um, 
the therapeutic turn, right? It's like coming out of the new left, there's, there's, there's an increasingly important role for therapeutic mm -hmm. sensibilities in the left. Mm -hmm. And uh, the left gets more and more involved in sort of how you feel. And it's like, I mean, that's important. I mean, I'm, I'm not against that, but like, there's gotta be limits because people are messed up. They've always been messed up. And getting back to that little, you know, story about the FMLN, I mean, that, that really struck me. It was just like, wow, these mm -hmm. people who, whether you like the FMLN or not, you know, they created the most sophisticated guerrilla army, according to Time Magazine, I think mm -hmm. Time Magazine is right, mm -hmm. that Latin America had ever seen. And it's like, they didn't do it because they were a bunch of angels who like didn't have big egos and didn't like, you know, right. you know, have bad psychological habits. They did it despite all that, right? So it's like, first of all, the idea that we're gonna arrive at some place where everybody's finally sane, you know, and that if we did, that, that then the class struggle would begin and we'd have like, you know, the oceans full of lemonade, et cetera, et cetera. I just don't buy that. Yeah. I, um, it also essentializes race and, and gender, right? In ways that are actually very reactionary, aren't they? they? They're saying that the most important thing about you is that you're white and a man and whatever you are, straight or whatever, right? It's, isn't that sort of like <laughs> yeah. doing the opposite of what they're claiming to, right? Aren't these, yeah. these are the racists and sexists, I think, are these people. Yeah. It, 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 it inculcates race reductionism, gender reductionism. Yep. Yep. And sure. it inculcates a kind of methodological individualism, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that society and social movements are just sort of the, the, the sum total of individuals, mm -hmm. as opposed to realizing that you know, when people come together in movements and institutions that, you know, what's going, something greater happens. It's not just the sum total of everybody's personal um, habits is in play there. And that, you know, and then also people change, you know, like, it's not that like institutions are often less shaped by the individuals than it is the other way around. You know, the individuals get into some role and then the role inhabits them. You see this with politicians. It's part of how, why it's difficult when you win, have one person in office, you know, uh, it's difficult for them to change the institution that they're in because it's like the institution in the office inhabits them as much as they inhabit the office. The, but most, you're in the most important thing is what you, Christian Parenti, think about black people. That's the most important thing. It's what you have in your mind about black people or women or trans people. It's what you think. That's what's most important. To me, that has been the line of the left for about two or three decades now. Right. And the and the counter argument would be like, no, what, what's most important is what you do, you know? And that actually what you think might be a lot, a lot less important, also be much less stable than you think. And sure that really like uh, it frequently follows from what you do. And if you start doing things then you're going to have a different set of ideas. You know, mm -hmm. if, if people uh, come together and work around a collective goal, like whatever bad attitudes they may or may not have had frequently go away. But also, I mean, it has to be said, it's like, you know, the United States has a lot of problems and there's a lot of bigotry and all sorts of stuff, but it's like, there has also been a lot of progress on these fronts. It's like I mean, the country is not as racist and as sexist and as homophobic as it used to be. I mean, everywhere I see evidence of this. Um, I mean, I married into a, a big extended Southern family and it's like, hmm. it is like, it is definitely not like it was in the sixties or seventies. People are definitely, I mean, I'm talking about like Christian conservative Republicans who are, are you know, light years beyond where their parents or grandparents might have been in terms of like, um, you know, people of different races and ethnicities marrying and, you know, different sexual orientation. I mean, people like, I think have, have moved a long way on this sort of stuff. This and is really, this is really interesting. What, what do you think about your uh, Christian Southern Republican in-laws? I love them. They're great people. I tend to love them too. Those people, you know, that people in that demographic I've, you know, growing up in Berkeley on the left, I didn't, I didn't meet her. I didn't know a Republican until I was in my twenties. I mean, I never met one. I didn't know a Christian. I didn't know a practicing Christian until I was in college and I'd never well, been I was... in the South. And I'd, I assumed that everybody in the South was hillbillies and rednecks. 
But now I, I find that they, I, I love the South and I love spending time there. And I find that people from the South of all colors tend to be much kinder and, and nicer and friendlier than people in the North. And mo- much more importantly, maybe far less racist. You will see. Yeah, I mean, my my yeah. wife is constantly talking about that. She just went down to Kentucky recently. She came back and, just, you know, it's like, yeah, it's, you know, the, the South is much more integrated than much more you know, North. I mean, it's like, yes, moving to New York, that really kind of freaked her out how like yes. race and class in New York really run concomitant. And it's just yeah. like the level of segregation is like compared to in Kentucky is intense. Yes. And mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and partly. You know, I think some of that has to do with the fact has to do with like what C. Van Woodward called, you know, the burden of Southern history, right? And the irony mm-hmm. of Southern history. So, mm-hmm. you know, this, the South is the only part of the country that shares an experience with most of the rest of the world, which is the experience of having been defeated in a war, occupied, told they were wrong, made to see that they were wrong and defeated and reconstructed. And, you know, and he says like, the, the, the burden of Southern history is for the South to learn this lesson, but also to teach it to the rest of the country, to teach the rest of the, the cult- country some humility. And I don't think that happened, but you can see that in the South. There's, certain, there's a certain kind of humility. If you're a white person in the South, it's like there's limits to posturing about how good you are because it's like, it's the, man, somebody, you go far enough back, somebody owned slaves, somebody served in the Confederate army, right? So you're not you're not squeaky clean. So just move on. Okay. And everybody knows that, you know? And so it's like, well, here we are now here, here I am now, you know, we're just here, you know, you're white, I'm black. We're at the gas station together. Like what? Exactly. Yeah. No, No, are you okay? Where where you're like, you know, are you from a suspect background? It's like, yes, yes. You know, in the South, in the past, you know, Walk, walk into almost any restaurant in the South, in the deep South, especially, and you're almost guaranteed to see like mixed groups at tables. You'll see blacks and whites sitting together commonly, and you rarely see that in Berkeley, and you rarely see that in Manhattan, right? It's just not a thing. It's a really remarkable difference there. Yeah. I mean, a lot of families are, are uh, much more integrated. I mean, like my in-laws, you know, through, through marriage and through adoption, um, you know, it's much, much more integrated than than um, you know the the kind of the scene in in Yankee New England where I was raised. But I was raised among Republicans, unlike you, because I was raised by my mother mostly. We lived in rural Vermont and rural Maine, and so it was like a lot of people I grew up with were, you know, quote unquote rednecks and right. um, Republicans. Yep, much less racist people, I think, in general. Um, back to uh, privilege walk, wokeness, and identity politics. So I was fascinated to find out from your article that Herbert Marcuse was connected to all this. His, his wife or former ex-wife um, uh, was, was the founder, the inventor of the privilege walk. And now you do write about this, but I kind of want to just set you up with this. What is the connection, if any, between Herbert Marcuse's ideas mm-hmm. and these politics that we're seeing now in the privilege walk and in identity politics generally? What is well, I wouldn't want to pin too much of this on Marcuse, but no. um, but the thing that he contributes is he, you know, he has a cynicism about the Western working classes, and he develops this at the peak of the sort of social democratic compromise, right? And so he's looking at the the working class in the OECD countries, and he's saying, look, they're just like. They're, they, they still are a class in, in, in themselves, but they can't become a class for themselves because they're, you know, just ideologically too compromised by patriotism and all the goodies and all this sort of stuff. I mean, it's like, and he passes away in 79, right? It's like right when the kind of neoliberal turn begins and deindustrialization and union busting really mm. picks up. And so that sort of aristocracy of labor that kind of, that, that, who had it made during the kind of golden era of the post-war golden era. I mean, they, they get smashed to pieces. So to be fair to Marcuse, he doesn't actually see what's right around the corner, mm-hmm. which is a vicious return of class reality to that, to that group of people. And so he said, because he, he lost faith in the Western working class's ability to organize as such and, and wage class struggle, he, explicitly looks for sort of new revolutionary 
protagonists. And he sees it in like the most marginalized in um, communities of color and, and, you know, the people who are socially excluded. And so he starts sort of advocating for a new revolutionary subject that is not the working class, but it is the, you know, something like uh, Negri and Hart's multitude. It's sort of like, you know, mm. the excluded, the, uh, the discriminated against, and that, and so ec- economic exploitation isn't completely removed, but it starts to take a, it takes a back seat in his analysis. And so that I think is his, his contribution. I, I did not find anything that suggested he was particularly involved in um, the creation of, of this methodology. I don't, I don't think he was involved with um, reevaluation counseling. It seemed that, that uh, Ricky, who starts out as a graduate student of his at Brandeis and then follows him to San Diego when he's um, run out of Columbia, uh, you know, she's already involved in reevaluation counseling. And it's like, they, you know, they're, they're only, they're only together. Like, I think it was like six years. Right. <clears throat> but I think Marcuse's intervention in Marxist thinking and left-wing thinking generally, I think was crucial for this. Um, so he's arguing, as you said, that the reason that the working class in America and in Western Europe aren't socialists is psychological. It's a psychological or cultural reason. They have been, as you said, they've been convinced by capitalist advertisers to love capitalism and love the products of capitalism in particular. And that makes it very difficult for them to gain a socialist consciousness, right? So if that's the issue, then everything must come down to convincing these poor people individually to think differently about wanting a toaster oven or to think differently about, you know, their need to drive a car, or it's it comes down to the individual's choice and their interaction with the world, right? I think that's really what advocating was for was sort of like for new, you know, for those for, for people who didn't suffer from kind of a false consciousness because they were at yeah. the bottom of the social hierarchy, that they were the ones who had to make revolution. They are the ones who had to kind of like um, move the movement forward, and that there that you couldn't there wasn't that much you could do for the, for the, for the bribed and um, ideologically confused working class. Yeah. But had the other, a different, different constituency was going to have to like push revolutionary change in the, the core economies of the capitalist world system. It's fascinating. I mean, I think, I think much of the problems with the left can be traced back to the Frankfurt school and Marcuse actually, I think it's not just this. But I think a lot of bad stuff came out of the Frankfurt School for me. Um, the- yeah, I mean, I haven't. I mean, I haven't studied the Frankfurt School closely enough to to agree or disagree on that. Certainly, I think a lot of the problem comes out of the new left. Yeah, um, you know, and yeah, I would hesitate to blame too much on a bunch of intellectuals. I think that the the foundations and um, the kind of you know. The infrastructure that they fund is really, really the key thing mm. that, mm-hmm. that, that kind of mal shapes the new left because also there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of tendencies in the new left. And so sort of what, you know, why do we, why do we end up with, with this residue of it? This yeah. kind of, you know, call out culture, identity politics, endlessly, you know, like the, the kind of like the, the sort of like endless hybridization of you know, more and more exotic and excluded identities. And it's just like, you know, that wasn't the only thing going on in the new left, but that's like, that's the kind of, that's sort of like, you know, what used to be called nationalism, right? This kind of like, this kind of like nationalist element in that politics really seems to be the one that has the most momentum. And it has to do also, as I said earlier, with I think the history of red baiting and silencing voices of people who are, who are sort of like class first. Mm. It's a and rich kids. It's a rich kids politics, I think. Yeah, yep. Yeah. It's a it's a rich kids politics. It's it's a politics that's use. It's it's fake leftism, basically. I mean, I mm-hmm. think that there's um, part of what happens in my reading of things. Part of what happens after World War II. This is laid out well in Francis Stoner Saunders book, The CIA and the World of the cultural cold war, the CIA and the oh, world yeah. of arts and others. Mm-hmm. And they, they realized that like, we can't convince in occupied Europe, we can't convince 
these, you know, European left-wing intellectuals to like America and become American patriots. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we can, we can kind of nudge this left away from the Soviet Union and we can sort of uh, indirectly influence them. And so like there were, they were competing with the Soviets who were setting up these, you know, palaces of workers culture in occupied zones and having like, you know, symphony orchestras play for workers and this sort of stuff. And then, you know, the U S state department would uh, try and have events where they're propagandizing people be like, but well, you don't let black people drink out of the same water fountains as white people. What, what about that? And it's like, uh, and, and they find themselves explaining like, well, you don't understand American federalism. It's like, that's not the federal government. That's these like Yahoo's in Alabama. And it's like, what, that doesn't make any sense. And they realize. What are we going to do? Oh, we'll just got to have to send jazz bands, you know, just like don't don't engage them in the argument. Exactly. Just like send jazz bands, send, you know, abstract expressionism. That's right. And this is kind of except it's like you, you're not going to crush and beat the left, but you can shape the left. You know, you're always going to have this opposition. So try and shape it into the kind of opposition you can live with. I mean, this mm -hmm. is all laid out in Federalist 10, right, mm -hmm. where Madison says you're never going to get rid of the source of faction, right? And most dangerous source of faction is, is the difference in property, those who have and don't have. Mm -hmm. And so what you got to do is you got to lean into faction, like let, let, let faction proliferate. What you don't want is like the majority of people who don't have enough property to unite against those who have too much property. Right. You know, so it's like, I mean, you cannot eliminate faction. So you got to lean into it. Let, let faction proliferate. It can actually be invigorating, he says. Right. So it's that logic. And I think that like the new left is very much informed by powers embrace of that logic, which is like, you know, you, you, you're never going to get rid of the left or you're never going to get rid of opposition. But you can shape the kind of opposition that this society has to live with. If this is an endemic problem, like, like deal with it as such. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. I think the class position of the left really explains a lot of its politics these days. Um, class position of the membership. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. The middle class, professional class nature of it. Yep. 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 So what do you think there, there are, I mean, we are, we're leaving out, you know, unions. There are, it's not like the entire left is middle class. There are, well, you know, working class members of unions who are politicized, but there's just yeah. not enough of them. But the lead, but the leaders of those unions tend to be people who went to college. <laughs> yes, right. Yes, like, or like yeah, they college. tend to be they tend, they tend to be people who went to college. Yeah, Yale, um, Yale in particular, a lot of union. I think it's something like or several union leaders are, went to Yale. I know that. <laughs> yeah, more conservative unions that you find more working class leadership frequently. Correct. I have a good friend who's who's pretty high up in the laborers' union. Oh yeah, and. She was raised on a commune in Vermont. She's still very ardent lefty, but uh, I remember once she said, I hate progressive unions. I was like, what, what do you mean? Why? And she's like, she just can't stand these like people with master's degrees, you know? And she Absolutely. like much, much prefer to hang out with these, um, you know, rough and tumble, sometimes sort of corrupt, but they're all corrupt. I mean, it's like, yeah. I was just talking, I was just talking to a friend of mine who, who, who had worked for SEIU who's one of the people who actually helped got me to, to, to think about COVID differently. He was working for a local SEIU local in Detroit. And in March or April, I think it was probably early April of 2020, I was talking with him and, and I was like, how are things going? He said, well, in Detroit, we can't get enough personal protective equipment for our members. But in Western Michigan and Northern Michigan, we literally have hospitals that are totally empty. They're totally empty mm -hmm. and they're going to they're gonna lay people off. So it's like, his job was like, like, you know, the COVID crisis in Detroit and then like the financial crisis of hospitals in Northern and Western Michigan. I was like, what? I'd never heard. I was like, what could this be? Hmm. And then, you know, end of April comes out a million point four healthcare workers lost their jobs in the month of April, 2020, because the, the states of emergency, as I explained in that piece, the states of emergency in all these states, pretty much every single state told hospitals you have to suspend elective procedures. You got to clear the decks for COVID. So that meant all of their income dried up. And then at the same time, the CARES Act says, okay, we're going to you know, offer 120% of Medicare coverage for any case that can be classified as a COVID case. And so as I argue in the piece that I think there, there was an unintentional um, 
set of circumstances that led to overcounting, overqualifying mm. deaths as COVID, because mm. hospitals were literally like facing financial crisis because of these government mandates. And then on the other hand, another part of government is like anything you can call COVID, we'll pay a twenty percent extra. Wow. You know, it's like yeah. what are you going to do? You, like you're, you're some hospital manager, you're, you're lay off people you've worked with for years, maybe some boy scout be like, well, I don't really know if these really are all COVID cases. It's like, hey, man, if they tested positive for COVID, call it a COVID case. Mm-hmm. Why not? Yep. And say that they died of COVID. Yeah. Right. Even though they died of a car, car accident. Right. But they had COVID in their system. Right. Yeah. Unbelievably corrupt and corruption that you know, determines whether people live or die. I mean, I think it's one of the worst crimes I have seen in politics, maybe in my lifetime. It's, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. It's really, really bad. I mean, and, and I mean, some of the stories that, you know, haven't been written up. We know a woman who's a nurse in Southern Vermont who had a child in New Hampshire um, in, a, I forget what hospital, um, which is just as well, because she tests positive. They took her baby from her for 10 days. Oh my God. And it's like, then when her pediatrician found out, he was like, what? It's like the kid was exposed to COVID in utero and and at birth, like this is totally nuts. And then at the same time, like her husband could visit both her and the baby or like, I forget what, maybe the the husband was like tested positive, but he could, it was just like, you know, that kind of stuff. New York city for at least a couple of weeks was not allowing women to have anyone with them when they gave birth. But I think that the um, that went out the window fairly quickly because the the staff in these hospitals were just like that's that's crazy that's like that's impossible. Good lord, good lord. I have it. I know someone here who had that experience in Oakland. I think she, I think she was in Oakland, and they would not let anyone be with her when she was giving birth. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. So her her child <laughs> was in isolation for the first several weeks of his life. Yeah. disgusting outrageous the thing i don't understand i mean what what i explained in that article is like all the big piece i understand why the you know the trump derangement syndrome politicization of this like you know how the overcount you know the state lockdowns and cares Act. but what i don't and i understand the messaging like the people just like you know accept the headlines that a lot of people don't really read or don't read that critically. And they just sort of ex- essentially, even if they have a critique of the New York times, they basically just accept the New York times editorial line. Right. But what I right. don't get is the, the alacrity, the passion that, that people usually, unfortunately lefties and liberals exhibited in, in its embrace of this kind of repression, this lockdown. I mean, like why weren't more people saying, wait a minute, that is totally barbaric to separate a, a newborn child from their, their parents. I mean, like where and where exactly, you know, you're going to need some really good scientific evidence to justify this. And the, I mean, I don't understand why people got it and, you know, snitching on their neighbors, all the, the sort of the passion that, that went into this, I, that part, I don't get. Virtue signaling, man. I told you cheap, easy virtue signaling. Yeah. And that does what it makes you feel good. It's just about some, like, it's like a dopamine hit. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I try not to do it myself, but I think that's what they get from it. It's like a drug. Oh, isn't how, it? how very virtuous of you. Exactly. Right. <laughs> I'm better than the virtue signalers. Um, what are you working on now? What's next? Um, nothing really. I don't have any big project, but good man. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I got, I've got a, a new, uh, not a new, I got a toddler and, uh, um, oh, wow. I've got, yeah, I've got some various other things I want to write, but um, I'm also, I'm not feeling, I'm not, I'm not in a rush to write anything. Good. So I've got, I've got a bunch of peeling paint. I got to deal with, you know, yeah. got yard work. Got I hear you. Stuff like that. I like that. Yeah. I like that. I'm anti-work. So I, I'm, I'm with you on this. This is good. I'm just, I really like what you've been doing lately. So I want to see more of it. That's all. All right. Well, I'll let you know Okay. When, when, when I publish some more stuff. Cool. Thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. As one child of the left to another, thank you for coming on. Okay. Well, thanks for having me on. Uh, I, I appreciate it. And uh, yeah. All right. Good luck with everything. Good luck out there. Thanks, Christian. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot, man. Take care. Okay. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To become a patron of the show and have access to bonus episodes, AMAs, the unreported news analysis show, 
go to patreon.com slash unregistered. Thanks for listening.